Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Am I, am I coming? Great, thank you very much. I just, my name is Mary Huckabee, and I am the Northern California Chapter Vice President um, Volunteer. And I want to welcome everybody that has driven, uh, I, from what I'm told, there's bad weather out there, not very good conditions. And I just want to say thank you so much for, for doing that and, and coming to our patient education days, actually your patient education day. Um, I would like to introduce my sister. This is Julie Reed. Julie is my sister. She's my best friend. She has always been my biggest supporter from day one, which was um, for me, well, it's all our life, but I was diagnosed with systemic sclerosis in 2001. Julie has been by my side in every way, and now she is heading our chapter. In addition to raising a family and working 60 hours a week at her regular job. And so this is my pride and my joy. This is Julie Reed. Um, yeah. You know, it's the importance of family um, when you are diagnosed with this disease is so important. And, you know, uh, if Mary wasn't my sister, she would still be my best friend. And, um, you know, I, I volunteered, you know, starting at walks and what can I do? What can I help? Uh, where can you need, use me? Then I went to, um, I got on the board. I don't know how that really happened. And then I ended up being the chapter president. And, and it's like, it's, it's an honor to be here and to do whatever I can to um, raise awareness, um, you know, fundraising to help everyone in this room because we've got a long way to go. Unfortunately, before there is a cure, um, we're going to introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Seth Ginsburg, and um, he has been the keynote speaker for the last two national conferences for scleroderma, and he is awesome. So with that, I'm going to introduce you. Come on up and... Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Awesome, that's the best introduction I've actually ever gotten because <laughs> brevity is the soul of wit, right? So um, I, I just, I took a photo just now of the two of you up here and um, I just wanna, before I start, tell you how beautiful it is to see you two here and with your arm around each other and it gives me goosebumps. And um, it, it, it is a uh, really, uh, it's really good to see that because it makes me feel um, passionate about what I'm about to tell you all and what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to visit and uh, have a, a chat about and, and uh, one of those key takeaway points is about never being alone and always bringing someone with you and always having someone uh, along for the ride and to see you uh, literally with your arm around each other um, does my heart good as my mom would say so uh, anyway Hi everybody, I'm Seth Ginsberg, and uh, I'm uh, really happy to be here. We're gonna spend uh, a little bit of time together here, and I'm gonna have a chat, tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things that are going on, maybe uh, get everybody um, amped up. Those were my instructions, get everyone <laughs> going today. Um, but then I, I really wanna uh, set aside a good amount of time for us to talk with each other and for you to ask some questions and for um, you all to participate as well, very important to me. Um, I wanna give you a little background, tell you who I am, why I'm here, but before I get there, uh, I'm interested, I, I always like to know, who came the furthest today to be here this morning? Massachusetts? Massachusetts? <laughs> Whoa. 
<laughs> right, this, this is how, how far? Where in California? Roosevelt. All right, nearby. Where? where? Oh, Dr. Seagal. Oh. Modesto. Very nice. Fresno. San Diego. Okay, okay. That's, that's pretty far. Uh, where else? Ma Malburn? Auburn. How foreign do I sound here? I can't pronounce half the cities in California. Uh, who else? Who else came far from far away today? I mean, the other question I like to ask is who came the nearest from the nearest? Is anybody who would say they are the absolute local here? San Francisco? Anybody like Japantown, San Francisco? Right here? Thank you for coming all the way over here, sir. We appreciate the trip you made, and I know it was rainy. So, you know, this is always a, a fun uh, exercise because it, it shows that uh, we have something in common, whether we're near or far from where we are together, but coming together is what's most important. I uh, personally came from New York, a small island called Manhattan, and um, I'm thrilled to be here. I love coming back to San Francisco. I love uh, coming to California. It's, it's, like, it's like New York without the snow. <laughs> And uh, we, as two states, uh, I, I think, anchor our country. And we are uh, two, uh, dare I say, of the most important states in our country because not only are we such uh, large states with so many people, with such diversity, with so many different walks of life, but I really believe that our country is uh, strengthened and our country is as good as it is because of our two states, New York and California, um, driving forward in our legislatures in Sacramento and Albany. I know both of them are probably as uh, equa, equa dysfunctional, shall we call it. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, those are our legislators, our legislature, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about advocacy uh, in, a, in a moment or two. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I will say uh, our, our state capitals are fun places, and I'm, I'm going to encourage everybody to hang out more uh, there, especially Sacramento, because Albany would be a long trip for you all to make. Um, but it's, it's great that we have... Um, we have two uh, very good states that keep our country as, as strong as it is. Um, having said all that, uh, I want to kind of break our talk into to three main sections. The first is how to take care of yourself a little better, how to make yourself feel a little better, how to, how to just think of the world a tiny bit differently perhaps so that we can be as strong and we can be as healthy as possible. The second thing or second area I want to talk about is how we can help each other, how we can take care of each other, how we can help others. Um, but these have to be done in order because you can't really take care of others until you first take care of yourself. And then the third thing I want to, third area I want to talk about is maybe pushing some boundaries, maybe doing something for the first time or embarking on a new area where you may not have uh, probably done a lot in the past, but um, I want to give you some really good opportunities to consider uh, trying new things, and they are almost entirely, uh, they all exist on the internet. And I want to just share with you some of the things that are going on online with social media. I know San Francisco is no stranger to you know, all things technology, but um, it sometimes might feel a little daunting to get involved in something uh, that you've never uh, participated in, like Twitter, for example. Um, but I, I want to uh, talk about why it's important and then just tell you how easy it is because I set my dad up on Twitter last week, and that means everybody can be on Twitter, okay? That is the official... Uh, bar that has been set for everybody now. Uh, Twitter is open for all now that my dad is on it and can actually uh, tweet. So um, first, uh, let's go back to helping ourselves. Let's talk about uh, why it's so important to uh, manage our conditions in as um, 
in as assertive, in, in as uh, serious a way possible. Um, now, you know, I, I, by way of background, I, I was diagnosed with a form of arthritis called undifferentiated spondylarthropathy when I was 13. And I've lived now 20 years, technically, with arthritis in the world of arthritis. Um, and people ask me all the time, what, you know, how do you feel? What, what's, what's it like? And my answer now is compared to what, right? <laughs> this is all I know. This is how I, this is how I live, you know? It's, just a given, if I'm gonna sit on an airplane, I'm gonna walk off feeling poorly. <laughs> or if I'm gonna walk down uh, or up one of these uh, steep streets, I'm gonna get to the top and my knees are gonna tell me how much they don't like doing that. Right. You know, there are all sorts of things that are inherent to living with uh, the conditions that we have. Um, but uh, I, I, I do it now, uh, I, I, I take care of myself in ways that put me first and also more importantly, really practice what we preach in terms of taking care of ourselves and accommodating for what we have to do um, so that we don't feel crummy at the end of a day. And I relate and I understand what uh, it must be like to live with a condition like scleroderma. You have, all of you have, um, you know, my full heart and um, my absolute admiration for being as strong and having to deal with as much as you do with scleroderma. And that's all of you, family and friends who you know, are a part of this, uh, I call it the, the journey of our condition. But the good news is it's more positive forward than it was in the past. The future is better for all of us living with all of these different forms of arthritis. That is fact. And with that one thought in mind, we now have to get there. We have to get to the future. We have to get there and we have to make it so that the journey is just as good as the destination. And every day that we're living with our condition is not just the day that we're gonna survive with our condition, but it's a day that we're gonna thrive despite what we're living with. And there are so many ways that we can do this, and there are so many things that you can do, little tiny things that all add up. Um, Mary uh, or Julie, I think Julie had mentioned, you know, 2%, 3% at the Amazon or the swipe card may not seem like a lot, but it adds up. And the same is true for the little things that you can do along the way that add up to feeling better. And uh, back to that kind of central theme for today, the, I think the primary thing to do is be surrounded by positive people, supportive people. Be with friends and family who understand but are also there for you. And do it in a way that it creates a team environment because otherwise we're all out on an island and no one likes to be on an island. And when you go to your doctor, for example, bringing a member of your family, a friend, a neighbor, somebody who cares about you with you to that doctor visit is a, is a guaranteed better position to be in than if you go alone. It's just that simple. And so when you're uh, thinking about your next doctor's appointment, I think it's key to think about, and for most of you this might already be a given, but it's, it's worth really stressing. Who am I gonna go with is just as important as when am I gonna go or how am I gonna get there? And bringing a second person to be a part of these visits, which are regular, right? Which are maybe quarterly or whenever, you know, eight, every eight weeks or whenever the doctor wants to see you again, it's important that you think of your doctor visits as an opportunity to show up with the team on the field ready to play ball and that that spouse or that family member or friend or neighbor has to understand that they're coming as support, as your wingman, <laughs> as they say, to allow themselves to be a part of the conversation, to listen to what the doctor has to say, to observe the way that you may be acting in the doctor's visit so that you can maximize that time together. You know, I think a lot of folks, myself, totally guilty of this all the time, 
You know, we think of our doctor's appointments as a box we have to check, right? You know, it's like, oh, doctor's appointment coming up. I got to get down there. I got to go to the hospital. I got to find parking, this and that. And then you go and you, you see the doctor and the question is, how are you doing? And the answer is, I'm okay. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. And because remember, compared to what, right? But, you know, when the doctor asks how you're doing and the answer is, I'm okay, that's not a good thing because that doesn't make use of the time with this expert. You know, I think of the doctor, in my life at least, my doctors as the coaches that are on the sidelines of the game who have seen the plays run a million times and they know you gotta go right before you split left and then you gotta turn. I don't know, I'm not really into sports, but you get the point. <laughs> You know, the doctor, though, is that coach who understands because they've got the playbook in front of them and they're going home at night and they're listening in to the new updates from the scientists and they're talking to each other at the conferences and they're reading the journals. Maybe they're online and the discussion forums. And the point is, you, as a patient, get access to this oracle at Delphi wisdom total opportunity to help you person on a regular basis, and I don't think most of us, I think that most of us do not take advantage of this the way we should. And that means showing up prepared, excited for the opportunity to have a, a conversation, and doing anything but saying, I'm okay, or eh. You know, so that this person in front of you, this expert, can understand who you are and what you're going through and how it is affecting you and what the medicine might be doing or what the medicine might not be doing with you, for you, so that he or she can be a better coach and that we can be on the field playing a better game that is gonna be more likely to be a winning game. And so, you know, I think it's just really important to, to stress this and I, and I wanna remind everybody because I think it's very easy to forget that when we go to the doctor, it's a team game and it's very much a back and a forth. And you know, I think, I, I know my doctors are all on pedestals and I look up to them and I respect them and I don't wanna piss them off, you know, and I wanna make sure everybody is you know, happy and I'm, I'm early and, and, and all that. But at the same time, you know, I, I have to remind myself not to be afraid to you know, push back, to take another five minutes and speak about how I actually am affected this you know, last couple of weeks and understand that you know, if I just spend 45 minutes waiting for the doctor, that means we can spend an extra five minutes visiting and I don't have to feel like I need to rush because it's not my job to get him back on schedule by making our appointment short. It's uh, his job to schedule maybe one patient fewer <laughs> in the day so um but we'll talk about the waiting room in, in a minute too because i think uh, I, i've discovered there are fun things to do while we wait for our doctor um and it, it helps to pass the time um so I, I also got a uh email late last night about um today because i had email just by a show of hands who uh, was able to join us for the who was here for the national conference in um at atlanta Oh great, so some of you came and it's great that you were there and most of you didn't. So all of my jokes sound new to most of you. <laughs> this is wonderful news. Um, but serious, in all seriousness, I, 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 uh, I have a really good friend. He's just somebody that I, I've known for, for a long time. Um, a doctor uh, who lives in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, who I met when I was 19 years old. I was. Um, I, I, I co-founded Creaky Joints when I was a, a, a little boy. I was 17 years old in a college dorm room. Um, and I, I started going to these conferences, these, these American College of Rheumatology meetings. And, and uh, the first one I went to, I was 19 years old, and I met this doctor, this young guy named Roger. And uh, he was from Brazil. First time I'd ever met a Brazilian uh, in, the, in the flesh. And uh, we just hit it off. We became buddies right away, younger guy. And all these years we've stayed, you know, of course, we've gotten much closer and we see each other and visit and all that. And so anyway, um, Roger, Dr. Levy, I should say, <laughs> Dr. Roger Levy, but Roger to me, uh, he takes care of a lot of scleroderma patients in Rio. He's, he's viewed as probably one of the 
um, m wisest and most, uh, I think, interested physicians um, for certain conditions, scleroderma being one of them, lupus another one of them, kind of a related a cousin of scleroderma, as, as I'm sure you know. Anyway, I, you know, so he, he cares a lot about scleroderma and has a, a ton of experience with it. And I, I emailed him, I said, Roger, what advice do you have for these folks here today that I could pass along? And I woke up this morning to this phenomenal email that was two sentences. And the first was, make sure they're prepared for their doctor visit. We got that part, right? And the second is, they better keep going because the future is really exciting. This is from one of the most respected doctors in the world whose head is always involved in patient care and research telling me to tell you that the horizon now has more and better opportunities and really cool things for us to, to think about um, ways that we can manage our condition medicines that are going to work uh, differently, but hopefully actually work um, in a lot of cases. And, and I just wanted to pass that along because I thought that was, uh, that was just a ray of light to wake up to and to hear his optimism um, and to know that you know, he's so positive and to share that um, with you all. So I want to take a pause here and I want to um, just make sure that my <laughs> message of taking care of yourself and staying positive and being with others and going at it together and understanding that your doctor is your, is your partner in this whole thing. I mean, has, is that resonating? Is that point clear? Have we gotten that down? Is that in our hearts and our minds? Okay, this means I could go home a success, all right? Because step one is, is taken care of and not 12 steps, don't worry. Um, <laughs> But step one really is taking care of yourself and understanding that um, we have a, a really amazing future here and um, our, our doctors are there to help and they're gonna, they're gonna help lead us to that future. And we have to be willing and able to go to that future that's bright and positive uh, with them. And so um, if you have uh, questions, if you have a single ounce of doubt in your mind that your doctor is maybe not the best doctor for you. And guess what, everybody? That is absolutely positively possible. That you might not have the right doctor for you. And I know people think, no, that can't be. This is the doctor I was given, the hand I'm dealt. This is what I got to deal with. But the answer is actually the opposite. There are a lot of doctors out there. And we have to be not just absolutely sure that our doctor is right for us, but confident <laughs> and proud and happy to say that we have the right partner in our doctor. And until you get there, keep searching for ways to get there so that you can um, make the most of these engagements, make the most of these visits, and not feel as though you're checking the box. And Creaky Joints, on our website, creakyjoints.org, we have uh, a whole lot of resources about this very subject, which is obviously very um, near to my heart, in that uh, we have a series called How to Break Up with Your Doctor. And it's a checklist, and it's a discussion about, you know, coming to terms and having that talk with your doctor. You know the talk, you know, it's not you, doc, it's me. <laughs> um, and giving that, you know, conversation a go, as scary and as crazy as that might sound, um, that might be something that would actually serve you best in the long term. And, and the thing uh, that we mention in, in a lot of these pieces is, don't worry, you're actually not going to hurt their feelings. Um, because they're focused now, if they're not right for you, they're already on to the next patient. And so, how to break up with your doctor, and then more importantly, how to find the right doctor for you, I think is another step you can take to better yourself, to feel better, and to make sure you're in tip-top shape for what I want to talk to about, to what I want to talk about now, and that's how to help other people. So, we did a survey, I don't know, about six or seven years ago, and I'm already dating myself, right? If you start early, you can pretend to be a 75-year-old man. <laughs> so, a long time ago, we did a survey. 
seriously, we did a survey of several hundred patients uh, who have RA, rheumatoid arthritis, which is um, a, a majority of our creaky joints community. Of course, uh, we have you know, a, a wide tent available for you know, resources for everybody. But we did a survey specifically of, of RA patients, and we found that 74% of people responded that they feel better when they volunteer during and after the time they volunteer. So we made this correlation between volunteering and feeling better. And just to be clear, when we say volunteering, especially when we talk about volunteering with you all or with our, or our friends with RA, we do not mean, we do not mean putting on a jumpsuit and taking trash off the side of the highway, okay? That is not the volunteering we speak of. I don't encourage anybody to do that type of volunteer work, but I do encourage you to hang out with the chapter office. Spend some time if you're able to geographically and it's convenient and you can go there. I remember I, I actually had to bribe my ninth grade bus driver with cookies my mom would make in order to make a unscheduled stop before the Helen Hayes Hospital that I could get out and go after school and volunteer because I had no other way of getting to the Arthritis Foundation. This is how I would, you know, if they only knew I had to kind of break the rules of school busing to get to my volunteer position three days a week in the ninth grade, but um, it's neither here nor there. But whether or not the scleroderma chapter, the foundation chapter is within reach or maybe there are other places within your community that you can volunteer, it will dramatically improve the way you feel, I promise you. And that might be spending time with someone who maybe doesn't have mobility and can't go out and you're just gonna visit for an hour or two. Um, I know nowadays that I'm uh, grown up um, I, my, my, uh, my volunteering, sometimes I, I spend, especially in the winter months, uh, I'll go to uh, some friends' houses. One woman, an elderly woman, she's 92 years old, she doesn't leave the house, um, and I go there. Ironically, she loves wine, so, you know, it makes the time really good. But, um, you know, just spending that time, uh, and that might explain why I always feel good when I leave time with her. Uh, but. But it, or it might be uh, visiting with some children or spending time with those who are less fortunate. Um, you know, think outside the box, but spend time helping others and it will make you feel better. But you can't do that until you take care of yourself first and of course put your needs first and take care of yourself and your condition so that you can help others. And part of it, I think, is understanding what this world is all about in terms of how different everyone's lives are. And maybe when you spend time seeing others who are less fortunate, it suddenly gives you new perspective on your condition, your situation. And maybe it's that psychological, or maybe it is just physically the opportunity to spread joy and make others feel better or provide someone less fortunate with something that also has its own, I think, emotional or psychological impact. And it's, it's amazing. And one thing about helping others that I think is uh, available to all of us now, especially with the internet, is the chance to advocate. And, and when I say advocate, I think people sometimes get the wrong impression. You know, they think now, now it's time now for the political part of the talk, right? And that's not at all the situation. It's time now to talk about how your voice, lending your voice Lending your story, lending your situation could be all you need to do to feel better because that alone will help people. And it will help people because when it's your voice and it's your voice and it's your voice and it's your voice and it's all of your voices put together, it's very powerful. And that powerful voice about your wants, and your needs and your demands as a community of people living with a condition like scleroderma, when we take this voice to the people who need to hear it, the people in charge of our lives, the people who make our policies or the people who make the regulations, the government, 
It's not a bad word, but it's, you know, the world we live in, the government. But our voice is crucial to helping them understand what it's all about. And so volunteering, you know, when you think about it, it does span the spectrum. It is maybe for some, no one in this room, putting on a jumpsuit and going out to the side of the highway and picking up trash. But on the other end of the spectrum, it might be helping the Scleroderma Foundation or joining Creaky Joints with a, uh, a little note of your uh, condition, your situation, what you go through so that we can and or the organization can take these voices to the people who need to hear it. And that's volunteering also. And it might be better and easier and more reasonable to say you can spend an hour a week doing that from your smartphone or your iPads or your this or your that on your couch where you're comfortable with those extra comfy socks. Isn't it funny? <laughs> Every couch has a comfy pair of socks that accompany it. I don't know. Or getting out there and helping others. And there's a spectrum here. And I want to encourage everybody to consider this in their mind because we can make a difference and help other people by participating in the process. And uh, now I will get a little bit more what we would call wonky, you know, a little more technical about policies and, and how they actually relate to us. There are, as you're all aware, a lot of different opinions about how our healthcare system should go, right? This is a dicey subject. And in my opinion, in my extremely humble opinion, it sounds to me as if the most vocal voices about our healthcare system are by the very people who don't have to live with the conditions we live with. These are people who are setting the tone and creating the environment that we, with our condition that we're going to have for the rest of our lives, have to now deal with, whether it's at the pharmacy counter, or it's at the doctor, or it's get the referral to get to this, to get to that, you gotta get permission to use the bathroom, and this and that. The whole thing sometimes feels incredibly overwhelming. But, I think, and I, and I, I, and I really actually believe that this is because we didn't do a good enough job helping them understand what we're going through in the first place. And now it's not too late to give them that opportunity so they understand what we're going through so that the corrections can be made, the fixes can occur so that we can get what we need. And in our opinion, that's access to care. And that means we have to start talking to the elected officials. That means we have to start talking to our representatives who we elected, mind you, and help them understand that we are people living with this condition and this is what it's all about. It's that simple. I mean, it, it literally is that simple. We don't have to necessarily come prepared with a 700 part plan that will solve all problems. That's not our job as patients. Our job is just to let them know that we are people who are living with a condition that affects us in the following ways. And when they get that understanding and when they get that sense, it helps them in turn make better decisions for us because those are people too. Politicians are people too. <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> but you can't blame them for not knowing what they don't know. And the same holds true for companies. You know, we, Creaky Joints and our uh, parent nonprofit organization called the Global Healthy Living Foundation, we are passionate about advocacy to improve access to care. You know, we've all experienced road rage, right? You know about road rage when someone gets cut off and they get crazy? We have road rage with insurance companies. We, we have the kind of rage that uh, we only unleash on the companies and the people who like wake up every morning to make our days miserable and by restrict access to care and, and so forth. And, and, and um, it turns out that you know, we're, not gonna, we're never gonna win a fight against a, a billion dollar insurance company, but we are going to chip away at them and we are going to address issues one by one that we understand to be coming in the way of 
us and the care that we deserve. And I'll give a, a real example of that, um, and that hopefully you can apply these examples to your, you know, to all the different situations you live with. There are uh, something called Medicare administrative carriers around the country, which are 12 regional, I believe it's 12, I think it's 12. There's a bunch of them, at least a dozen. Regional groups of administrative carriers that are companies hired by Medicare to administer Medicare. There's a company that you've never heard of. There's one out here, I believe it's called Noridian. Has anyone heard of Noridian? Of course not. I mean, they're the most invisible company in the world. But they exist in order to manage Medicare so that money gets saved. How does money get saved? By making our lives harder. By restricting our access to the care we rightfully need or deserve. And so just to give you like this insane example from the last couple of weeks of what we're going through, one of these Medicare administrative carriers, Noridian specifically, uh, decided that if a medicine were available for uh, a, real, a bunch of diseases like rheumatoid arthritis that was both an injection as well as the same medicine for an infusion, okay? You know, you know, you have to go to your doctor, so it's an infusion or you get a shipment in the mail in a freezer and it's an injection. But if both of those are available, you're no longer covered for the infusion. You have to take the injection, right? This is called the self-administered drug list. This was in a midnight, some Tuesday night ruling that this random company we had never heard of that administers a part of Medicare that we weren't even familiar with in the first place we woke up and realized that this was going to be a huge problem for a lot of people who can't take an injection because their hands aren't able to use the plunger. And so we called Noridian and we said, are you out of your mind? Why would you ever do this? And they said, well, it's a cost containment issue. You know, we have to manage costs somehow. And we found that the cost for an injection, a Part D drug is a lot cheaper than a medical necessity Part B drug and blah, blah, blah. And I said, time out. These are for people with rheumatoid arthritis and all the other related conditions. You know they can't sometimes use their hands right, or PS, they might just be afraid of needles, or any number of 100 other reasons that could have been the reason why they didn't want the injection, like they can't keep it cold, or you know, they're afraid that, you know, of, of transportation, or whatever it is. And, and you know what the answer we got was? Wait, people with RA sometimes have trouble using their hands? <laughs> After that conversation, we had the opportunity to get that stupid ruling reversed and we put that fire out simply by informing these administrators of reality of living with, in this case, rheumatoid arthritis. And I can't think of a better example now of what it means to advocate and to present your story and share your situation in a meaningful way so that people, whether they are elected officials in Sacramento or Washington, D.C., or they're administrators for a company like Noridian, whatever it might be, they need to hear from us. And groups like the chapter and the National Office of Scleroderma Foundation, groups like ours at Creaky Joints and GHLF, will do most of the work. We'll get you all the way to that finish line, so all you have to do is that. And just speak up and share your voice and explain your situation, and then the rest will work itself out, I promise you. I know this for a fact. And we created something called SETS 50 State Network. I have no idea who it's named after. <laughs> but the 50 State Network now is a, an initiative we started last year which allows people with all different kinds of chronic conditions to share their voice but then learn about all of the ways that you can participate in this process and we could paint a better picture of what life with our conditions are all about. And if you go onto our website, GHLF, Global Healthy Living Foundation.org, 
uh, right there on the homepage, we'll, you know, there's a, a link to start to sign up for Sets 50 State Network. And, and, and it might be as simple as getting an email once a month with updates in your region, or if you want to participate in conference calls, you can dial in every couple of weeks. Or if you want to start writing letters or emails, I mean, all the different things are available. It's G H L F dot O R G. And for the first question of the day, that was a good one. <laughs> um, and, and so advocating, I, I want everyone to understand, is our duty, is our responsibility, but is actually a really hip way to volunteer, not just your time and your energy, but your story and your situation to help other people. I think it's a phenomenal opportunity and I want to I want to stress this, and it, of course it's it's with the Scleroderma Foundation and all of the advocacy efforts um, that they spearhead, and then ours. You know, we find ourselves we obviously our history is in arthritis, of course, and musculoskeletal issues. But today, I'm proud to say our organization is actively fighting all around the world for all kinds of access to care. But it's interesting because. It tends to be us with arthritis or autoimmune related conditions advocating for folks who might have cancer and might need access to cancer medicine or MS or Parkinson's. And this gets back to what I was saying earlier. It feels good to help other people and it puts everything in perspective to be able to say, hey, I go through this. This is how challenging it is for me, but it's not cancer, God forbid. And the, these people have to go through that, and, and, and that's not right. And so we have the opportunity to help countless people by getting more involved and by sharing our stories with the people who need to hear it. So that's one way to help other people. Um, I want to take a pause here and ask, are there questions? Does this resonate? Is this something that sounds scary, or is this something that you guys can get into? I see a lot of nod, nodding of the heads, and you're either falling asleep or you're <laughs> agreeing. And I hope you're agreeing. So, yeah. Um, my name is Patricia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I was listening to what you were saying about our doctors being part of our coaches, and that resonated in me because now I have an appointment with my girly derma specialist on Monday. And I'm going to... I'm gonna, the first thing they're gonna ask is how am I gonna do, I'm gonna have my list ready and prepared to go. But I'm also gonna let them, you're part of my team to help me live my amazing future. I love that and I think they will re respond to that in a positive way to help keep me well and give me the treatment that I need because I want an amazing future. I want them to help me and to coach me and those are new words that I will use when I go to it. So thank you so much, you're awesome. <laughs> I love it, thank you, that's fantastic. And you know what, if, if your doctor doesn't look you in the eye, if your doctor, if this is all you see of your doctor, how to break up with your doctor in five easy steps on creaky joints. You know, like you're entitled to your medical records. Those are yours, not his or hers. You're entitled to, you know, a transfer of, of uh, knowledge from the old doctor to the new doctor, all those things. But I love that attitude. And you are going to go in there, and that is going to be the best doctor visit you've had in a long time with that attitude. That's exciting. And then, you know, I think the next step of this is not just being prepared for the visit on Monday, but what are you going to do Monday night? or Tuesday, after the visit. And this is something else that, you know, Creaky Joints and GHLF, and we, we think a lot about. It's like, how can we log and, and diary and uh, keep track of our visits afterwards so that we can start to look at how it's going, what patterns are developing? This is my impression of me every time I leave the doctor's office, okay? I walk out the door and then, oh, I forget to ask that one question, right? And then when I started writing down those questions beforehand, of course it would help to fix that. But when I started writing down after doctor visits that I felt like he was distracted, for example, or I felt like you know, I was rushed and I didn't get to ask all my questions, 
those started to show me signs that that one particular doctor that I had to see wasn't the right doctor for me. And so getting that prepared is a, is a phenomenal thing. We have a problem that's on the horizon. I want to point this out just because we're always thinking about the future. You know now all these doctors have to use the computer, right? Called the electronic medical records. And they have to sit there and it's mandated by law. And it's a good thing overall because, you know, there's a time and a place for typewriters. The doctor's office is not one of them. But the unintended consequence of that is now you've got doctors on their mouses trying to figure out how to code the doctor visit and the put the this and the that and the pull down menu and the, and we're gonna have to work through this problem because we're starting to see more and more doctors are you know they have to do this it's 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 a it's it's forced uh, for good reasons but the, like I said unintended consequences this is all you see of your doctor um, and I, I think it's worth everybody here knowing, if you took one thing away from today, you could say, hey, doc, how about looking at me in the eye? Could you imagine if you said that to your doctor? Don't be afraid of saying something like that because it will put him or her on notice that you are a person and not just a subject number 11669 that's in the office, but someone that also needs a little eye-to-eye -eye contact actually what happened to me the last time I saw my rheumatologist and I actually said to him you know this impacts rapport with you and he said to me you know we have to do this and this is how we get paid now perhaps he could have verbalized it a little differently and I wouldn't have been so offended but I've been back to him and I know I need to go but I have an issue with doctors who it's all I know it's all about money but they can also write stuff down and then go back and put it in the, their note tablet, in, in my opinion. And I suggested that to them. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I, 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 all we're doing here is pointing out a very real issue, right? But now we have to think of very real solutions and we have to think of the things that we can do to deal with it. We, we appreciate their side. I appreciate they have to earn a living. Most doctors are dramatically, Dr. Segal, all doctors are underpaid and they're overworked. But that doesn't mean they can't look us in the eye and do something a little differently so we feel like people that they're taking care of or partners in, in the program. And so, you know, I hope when you do go back, you can bring that how to break up with your doctor, five easy steps. I just wanted to share that um, the smartest thing I ever did was to correlate all of my doctors under one roof. So I now, you know, with UC Davis or Sutter or wherever you choose to go, do them all within that group. This way, everyone can watch what's going on with you medically. Bev, fantastic, fantastic advice. And, you know, I, I will say I'm envious. I've always been envious. New York, I look at California with envy about your health plan systems um, are generally really well organized and you can have a dermatologist and a rheumatologist and a primary care physician and then when you bump your head when you go to get the cat litter a neurologist and anybody else and they can see each other's notes and that is very important because it is centralized and so these are the good things about technology right these are the positives that are coming um, but uh, we have a um, uh, a long list of things that we can do to better ourselves with our doctor, but don't feel like you have to do them all at once, right? Little things, those little comments will add up and make a difference. Uh, the last bit I want to talk about here in helping others, and uh, I, I, this, is, this is the most exciting part, is what it means to participate in research. And I know you've heard this story a million times, right? Research is your friend, participate in research, sign up for this, be a part of that, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, all of those things, times a million. But I think about it, and we think at Creaky Joints about it a little bit differently. We think research should mean giving the scientists and the researchers and the doctors, and for that matter, the public, an understanding of who we are and doing it by all participating in little 
things, again, that share our situation so that we can add up everybody's situation in a way that then starts to shed light on what's happening. And think of yourselves all as one little clue. And that tiny little clue, when you add them all up, can be, become big clues for the people that are starting to look at the patterns, or starting to look at the responses, and starting to look at what might work better. And uh, we have here on, on, every, on the table here um, a little flyer about Creaky Joints because we just started this new initiative on our website called Creaky Joints Pro. And all it means is registering with the website and, and sharing completely anonymous information about what you're going through, what medicines you're taking, what you used to take, uh, all of these things so that now we can start to expand our understanding because there are millions of people, right, that have all of these related conditions that we now are able to look at in what's called a common data model so that everybody's you know, 300,000 people with scleroderma, 2.2 million people with rheumatoid arthritis, 5.5 million people with psoriatic. You know, when you add up the individuals, the sum is much larger. And that gives us a very clear understanding or a better understanding. And uh, as it relates to scleroderma, here's one thing I will say that uh, Roger had mentioned to me as well uh, the other day. Uh, he, you know, I think the fact is there are a lot of promising therapies on the horizon for scleroderma. However, uh, the ones that are out there are a little out of reach because I don't think that the regulators like the FDA or the researchers for that matter realize how badly we want it, how much we need it, and all of the ways that these therapies can help us. And it, it, it means to me that we have a bigger responsibility and we have more uh, importance on participating in these projects so that these therapies can become within reach and then they can become approved for an indication like scleroderma and they can become covered by the insurance company. And none of that happens without all of us participating. And with creaky joints, you know, we're not about experimenting or clinical trials or any of that. We're more about helping the world know who we are as people. And that's why I would really love for you to register and participate in our programs because sharing a little bit about yourself, again, in a completely anonymous way, allows the experts to begin to see what's going on and understand how we feel about our doctors, for example, or understand how we're responding to certain things, whether they're volunteering or medicines or just going for a, a, a swim or something. And all of this information, because we have so many millions of people now orbiting our community, we need everybody to, to share a little bit so that we can add it all up and put it where the sun don't shine for some companies, but also share it with the public and make them aware, or with the elected officials and make them aware, or the regulators like the FDA make them aware. So research is a new word, in my opinion. Whatever you used to think about research, whatever you thought it was about drinking this green vial of stuff, tell us if you grew a third year, or whatever that might be, that's, that's something from a bygone era. I think today, research means spending two minutes on your laptop or your iPad or your phone and just giving a little bit of information to help go a long way for everybody to understand us better. And research is our duty, it's our job, because so many people came before us to participate in research just so we could get to where we are today what are we going to do for the people that come after us? And that's use technology, the greatest thing to happen to our generation. Technology, trust me, you might not love it, and there are times when I hate it. But technology is an amazing thing, and it finally intersects with knowledge, with humanity, with who we are as people, and with communication tools, and then with researchers and with the scientists and with the doctors and with everybody else. We are at that point. This is a crucial time 
So this is a new word research. That means we are together going to forge ahead and make that future ours, because we deserve it. But we're not gonna get there without participating. We're not gonna get there without helping other people along the way. We'll feel better in the process, but we'll also get to where we need to go quicker, and we'll get there with the sense of uh, accomplishment, because we got there together. And the scleroderma community is so important to participate in this. Your voices need to be heard, not just for advocacy reasons, but for the development and the research and the, the realization of these dreams that I know we share. They're coming, they're in our future, and only we can accelerate that by engaging and by participating and by taking a couple of minutes to be a part of that process. That is my pitch for why you should be a part of research. That is my new definition of the word research. That is something I hope everyone leaves here today to sign up for Creaky Joints. It's totally free. We'll never sell anything. If I were selling, if I were good at selling, I'd be out on the street with shoes and a kiosk. But instead, I just want to make everybody feel better. And that's why we created and we labored for the last 18 months or so on, on putting this together. So, by all means, I, I would invite everybody to participate so the scleroderma community on Creaky Joints can have a, a larger voice and have more uh, activity, which it deserves. And that, of course, gets shared, you know, in, again, de-identified, anonymous way with our partners and friends at, at the foundation and then the researchers here at UCSF and everywhere else. So um, that is my pitch for why you should participate. Last bit and then uh, other uh, questions, if you might have them. This Twitter thing is amazing. Uh, my dad sat me down yesterday, uh, last week, last weekend, and he said, you know, I think it's time I joined Twitter. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, you know, I keep seeing it on all the ads, and I keep hearing about it on CNN. CNN, just so he could talk to Miles O'Brien, was why he wanted to go on, CNN, on uh, Twitter. Um, and it took five minutes to sign up. And, and then he said something very cute. He said, I'd like to go out and buy a book so I can learn how to use this. And I thought, you know, that's a novel idea, buying a book to learn something on, about the internet. But uh, lo and behold, we went to the bookstore and there's an entire section of books, nice big books with illustrations that take you through step by step something like Twitter and I encourage everybody to get on Twitter to be a part of it because it's how we can talk to each other and most importantly, you might not think of yourself as someone who needs to be on Twitter, right? I mean, we did all right all these years without Twitter. I think we'll be okay without Twitter. But the answer is the reason why you should is so we can talk to, and this is the secret about Twitter, Social media or Facebook can dramatically sway these elected officials' opinions when they sit there and they read their tweets about anything. And so if you needed a reason to get on Twitter, it's not so you could share what you had for breakfast this morning, okay? Because trust me, we don't care. And you know, if you have friends that care, good for you. But what we should be on Twitter to do is raise our voice and share our perspective and speak out on issues. Because when you use Twitter, you can do it in a way where the elected officials and the word like scleroderma, for example, can be tagged, can be referenced to, to your tweet. So suddenly the folks in Sacramento or the folks out down in Washington they will hear it and it will register. I promise this. The thing about Twitter is every one of these elected officials, you know, to feed their ego, <laughs> need their Twitter accounts. And that is something they're. Facebook is a completely different version of Twitter. <laughs> you know, Twitter is about talking back and forth yeah. in very quick, very succinct ways. Facebook is about sharing through graphics and in pictures and, uh, and the like with uh, a more of a visual Im impact. Um, 
they're very different, but they're very good, both of them, for what they do. The Creaky Joints Facebook page has an average of half a million conversations a day that people are sharing and, and talking about. And it's because the woman who handles our page is the funniest woman in the world, and her humor really resonates with people. And then it gets serious during the day, and then back at night, it's very funny before you go to sleep. And those are the kinds of things we do, so of course you're invited to join us. But set your own account up. Set it up, it's free, it's easy. Someone in your life will show you how to do it, and that is why you have to be on social media so that your voices can be heard. And that's it, really. <laughs> so thank you. So, you know, we, uh, we covered a lot today. Taking care of yourself, very important. Approaching your doctor a little bit differently in your mind. Taking care of each other and helping others. Participating in the process and the relentless pursuit of learning more about ourselves and each other with research. Advocacy is probably not what you thought it meant, and social media and Twitter is something that you have to do. This is a must. I am not coming back here uh, until everybody is on Twitter so that we can tweet with each other all the time about breakfast. Just kidding. And, uh, you know, your, or your, your uh, regional, I'm sorry, state, 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 regional, state, Northwest California? Nor NorCal. NorCal, sorry, okay. The NorCal Scleroderma Foundation needs your volunteer time and energy. And now that we've talked about a couple ways you might be able to do it from your couch with your socks on, I know they would take that, but also to come to the events and to participate in the programs is, is also important. Um, that's all I really have to say today, but I want to make sure we answer all the questions that we need to when we visit here and everybody uh, leaves happy.